I'm Tim Moss. I'm the Health Content Manager at Healthy Mail. Healthy Mail is a national organisation funded by the Australian Federal Government and we provide easy access to the latest scientific and medical advice about male sexual and reproductive health. Tonight's webinar is part of the Healthy Mail Men's Health Week program. Our topic for tonight is everything you want to know about men's sexual health matters. Before I introduce tonight's guest, I just want to do two things. First, I want to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of our country, in particular, the Bunurong people. Uh, they're the mob who've lived on and cared for the country where I am and uh, looked after it for thousands of years. I thank them for that. Second thing I need to do is let you know how you can ask a question tonight. This is all about you guys uh, kind of driving the show. If you're watching in Zoom, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We've disabled the comments because they're too distracting. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook Live, just put your question into comments. Okay, get the ball rolling now. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest for this evening, andrologist and urologist, Dr. Gideon Bletcher. Hi, Gideon. Hi, Tim. How are you? I'm great, thanks, mate. That's good on this good. Men's Health Week. <laughs> now, Andrologist and urologist, that sounds like two things, but you're only one man. What is an andrologist and urologist? Look, um, urologists are, are surgeons who look after anything to do with the urinary tract, so kidneys, ureters, bladders, prostates, testicles and penises, but also, also the bladders of females. So it's not just men, it's also women. Um, and I guess an andrologist is really a, a, a bit more of a general term, but someone who really does focus on, on the man, on the males. And uh, I, I spend a lot of my time and uh, uh, both in the past and now present uh, looking after both men and women, but I really focus on, on a lot of male related particular issues. Um, uh, and I'm sure we'll, we'll speak about a couple of those tonight. So hence why I kind of use the title andrologist as well, because I, I have a lot of different training which focuses on, on male related issues quite specifically. Yep, how long did you go to school for? <laughs> you mean how long was I studying for in total? Yeah. Oh, look, it's a it's a journey, isn't it? You know, I mean, Great. it's not it's about brilliant. a destination. I people say that when you when you're a doctor, oh, you know, uh, how long does it take to get to where you are? And you know, I sort of say, well, look, if you're going to be, you know, in charge of a business or something, it's not going to it's not going to take you two years. Uh, it's going to take you a lot longer. So I I graduated from medical school in 2004, and that took me six years from there. And, so uh, I've been a consultant, uh, so finished all of my urology training in about 2015. And from then until, uh, you know, more recently, for about three years, I was doing extra training on top of that over in the UK. And then I've come back uh, almost two years ago now. So that's brought me to the current point. But it's not, yeah, it's not a race. It's an enjoyable thing doing what I do. So yeah, it's taking a while, but uh, that, that journey is not over. Yeah, good. That's good to know. So... What does a day look like in the um, working week of Dr. Gideon Bletcher? Or what does a normal working week look like? How many patients do you see? Just so you get an idea about Oh, that. wow. Okay. Well, um, I mean, my week is split up into lots of different pockets of time. It's not like I just sort of turn up to work. That's the nice thing about my work, I guess. And it's split in different ways. Uh, so it's split, say, between consulting. So I'm in my uh, consulting rooms now where patients can come and see me. Uh, and we'll talk about issues and discuss options and treatment strategies and maybe surgeries if they may need them. Uh, then my time's also divided partly in the public system. So I work at public hospitals as well. So uh, I can look after different parts of the communities. And uh, then also uh, there's the operating that needs to be done. So uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's sectioned into those uh, areas. And sometimes I'll be operating in the private sector, sometimes in public sector and Similarly, so with uh, uh, with consulting and consulting wise, how many patients would I see? Uh, for example, I saw about uh, ten patients this morning, uh, and then I saw about seven or eight patients this afternoon, and that's repeated on most days if I'm not operating. But uh, got to take some time out here and there as well. So look after the the kids. I've got kids as well, so you know, I try and lead a fairly balanced lifestyle um, and uh, trying to look after myself along the way as well. Good, which is really important. We know that we all need to look after ourselves really well. So next question is, what are some of the common problems that you see? 
Uh, so as an andrologist, uh, I, I, I see a lot of um, problems to do with the penis and sexual health. So uh, erection dysfunction or erectile dysfunction is probably one of the more common things. Uh, male subfertility. So uh, when people think about infertility, most of the time we sort of gravitate towards you know, the female partner and say, well, you know, that's where the issue lies. But amazingly enough, uh, men contribute to that problem a lot, you know, 30, 40, even up to 50% of couples will have, you know, the male either partly or fully responsible for, for part of that problem. So I do deal with males and, uh, and their sperm production related issues, uh, either trying to improve it or trying to find sperm that we might be able to use. Um, Peyronie's disease, which is a, a condition which most people have never heard of, but is probably uh, surprisingly common in the community. It, it causes curvature of the penis, which may not be a problem if it's a minor curve, but certainly if it's a, it's a larger curve, then you know that can you can put your mind forward and imagine how that may cause issues. Uh, so there's some of the some there's some of the more common issues that I might come across, but there are simple things that are very common in andrology, like foreskin issues. Uh, you know, you can get a variety of issues which may need to be addressed there. Um, uh, ejaculation problems, either premature or absent or delayed ejaculation. Um, and then in the realm of the urologist, I mean, we, we deal with a lot of other issues which are very common. Those things sort of include kidney stones or urinary symptoms. So guys with prostate symptoms, you know, they're not peeing very well and it's deteriorating. They're really common. Uh, and I deal with those, but also many, every urologist would basically be dealing with those issues as well. So, I mean, a urologist has a very broad um, spectrum of the things that we deal with. Um, and obviously, we're, tonight we're talking predominantly about the men. So that's why I'm focusing on the men issues. But certainly women can have kidney stones and bladder problems too. So we'll look after those. And they're, they're very common as well. Uh, and then you've got the realm of, of cancers, obviously. So kidney and prostate, testicle and uh, other rare cancers like penile cancers uh, are certainly to be dealt with by someone like myself or my colleagues. I guess that's what's cool about uh, a job like yours is the variety that you get. Like you say, you're in your consulting rooms now and speaking to people in sort of an office situation and, and, and then being in the surgery. But even within that, there's a whole breadth of, of things that you're concerned with. I, I think that must be you know, interesting, exciting, I think. Yeah, I, that's one of the reasons why we choose urology. It's, it's, it's interesting and uh, it's a broad amount of work. But at the same time, that's why I like to try and narrow down the fields that I work in uh, because there are so many different other things that uh, urologists can be doing. Yeah, yep. So I had another prepared question, but I'm going to go straight to questions from our audience because mm -hmm. they're kind of aligned with what I was thinking of asking you next anyway. Yeah, great. So somebody said, how common are varicoceles and what's the quickest way to treat them and can they affect my sperm count? And what I was going to say is if somebody needs to see you about something like that what are the steps they can't just google you and make an appointment and see you in a couple of weeks time you know you, there, there's there's a first step that you need to take if you've got something like a varicocele that might be concerning well i think let, let's start off it's a really good question uh by the way and i didn't mention varicoceles but varicoceles mm -hmm. are really common uh so in terms of well how common are they 10 percent maybe of men may have a varicocele. Like it's, so it's super duper common. Hey, you, um, you yeah. in, um, so for those 90% of men who don't have them, what mm. are exactly. you? Exactly. You, 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 you've, got, you've got the question and I'll hopefully have the answer for you. So a varicocele is a um, basically like a varicose vein. So sometimes people get swollen, full veins in their legs or calves, and you can actually get those in your scrotum. Now, some men may just feel down below and have a feel, and they may notice something that's a little bit fuller. It feel, feels like a bag of worms is how they've described, but that's typically when they're a little bit more obvious. And the reason why they happen is because you've got veins which drain the blood away from the testicles and the scrotum, and those veins go all the way up into your abdomen. And when you're standing up, sometimes the blood from your abdomen actually pushes down and uh, just sinks down to the lowest point because of gravity, and that's in the scrotum. Yeah. So you can get these veins, which are particularly large or big, uh, particularly after exercise or at the end of the day or during prolonged standing. And what people may notice is sometimes they are uncomfortable. 
so some men will present because of discomfort. And uh, the question was asked whether uh, this can affect fertility and whether or not we should do anything about it. And that's a great question. The short answer is, is that these varicoceles are much more common in men with subfertility. So, um, you know, if you're talking about, well, when people come into my rooms and I see them, uh, if they've got a, a sperm production issue, we're going to talk 45% of those guys will have a varicocele. Mm -hmm. So they're much more common. And the evidence seems to suggest that, in fact, there is some sort of a connection between the two. And yes, often by treating them, not always, but often we can improve the, the, the sperm parameters on a semen analysis. So when men have concerns that maybe they've got some fertility issue, uh, probably the first step is to get a semen test with the GP. And uh, that's a really good baseline test to be able to assess, you know, uh, an, an amount of how the sperm production is going along. It's certainly not everything because there are some men who have a completely normal semen analysis, but they've got some sort of issue why they can't uh, bear natural children. But it, it's basically our best baseline test. Yep. So um, the, I guess in answer to your question, Tim, the, the first step would probably be to go and see a GP and get it assessed, have a look, you know, make sure it's not something else because uh, there can be other things that happen in the scrotum, which we need to look out for. But um, GPs are well-placed to assess for a varicocele. And, um, you know, if, if, if someone thinks that they've got a problem and they want it addressed, well, then sure, you, you can go and get that um, seen by a urologist. Um, and the treatment options, there's a few different ways of addressing varicoceles. Yeah. I mean, if it's not bothersome and it's not causing issues, you could probably just leave it well alone. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you wanted to do something about it, there's a, a really nice way using um, uh, basically coils which are put into the veins so that the blood doesn't track back down into the scrotum. Yeah, right. Now, those coils, we call that embolization, and that's done by often either a vascular surgeon or a radiologist. Yeah. And uh, it's a pretty neat way of doing it uh, because the risks of that sort of procedure are fairly low. Yeah. Uh, but like anything, you probably wouldn't want to have it done unless there was a good reason for doing it. Yeah. Um, but uh, there are other alternatives like surgery and I offer surgery and there's different kinds of surgeries to deal with this. Mm -hmm. um, and the benefit of surgery is that it's got a slightly higher success rate yeah. uh, than embolization. But... I mean, we're talking 80% success rate for a varicocele roughly and maybe 90, 95% success rate for surgery. Yeah. It depends what surgery, but the surgery has slightly higher increased risk. So you've got to weigh that up and uh, different strokes for different folks, I guess. But that's why I think if you're thinking about having a varicocele treated, you've got to, number one, have a reason for it. And maybe getting a semen test might be something to consider Seriously, if you're having, having difficulties. Uh, but... Um, uh, certainly a, a urologist is well placed to have that discussion uh, and that takes up a lot of my time and I enjoy talking to patients about it uh, because it's one of those areas where yes we can do something to try and help uh, improve the the semen uh, production and hopefully your fertility thereafter. Yeah thank you you mentioned before subfertility and we didn't really go far into that but I guess it's that sort of thing that the varicocele is affecting that you know you might be on the cusp of uh, being able to conceive children naturally with your partner. Um, and, you know, there's just one thing that's kind of getting in the way, I suppose. Yeah, there might be one thing or there might be multiple things. Um, so sometimes people may have multiple reasons why their sperm production is just not, you know, as, as good as it should be or could be. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the time, these things are actually environmental things. So, and I'm not talking about toxins. Yes, toxins out in the community may play a role, but I'm talking about the simple things. I mean, I mentioned, you know, we talked about, you know, me looking after myself and taking time. I mean, I take time to, 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 to keep fit and I, I like running. And so that's just what I do. But keeping fit, keeping well, actually has definitely been shown to improve sperm production and sperm function. So avoid obesity i mean it kind of gets tedious sometimes when you speak to doctors and they sort of say oh look uh you know uh what else have you got to tell me doctor you know so i can improve myself and they'll say the same things but really it just it just happens to be that obesity uh, and poor lifestyle can certainly significantly impact sperm production the same as smoking heavy alcohol use uh significant amount of stress so by making sure that we're looking after ourselves we're not only doing that for prevention of heart problems and uh, blood pressure and strokes etc avoidance of cancers we're doing it for our sperm as well so you know i guess it's uh, and, and and you feel great obviously yeah it's kind of magic though isn't it looking after yourself because like you say you do decrease your risk 
so many different problems that are, that are common to men. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I took it upon myself this week, Tim. I don't know about yourself, but whenever I spoke to any of my mates this week, I asked them, I said, look, how are you going? Are you getting out there? Are you doing something? And a couple of them sort of said, look, you know, I'm getting back on my bicycle. I'm thinking about that. So I, I really think it's important. Doctors need to do it. But also, you know, people out there who do take their health, you know, seriously and are active, bring your mates along, ask them, encourage them. I mean, this is, this is what we need to be doing as men. We need to be looking out for each other. And I guess this doesn't extend just to men, obviously. I mean, any female out there who cares about men, you know, encourage us, get us out there, bring us along, uh, you know, keep prodding us. And I think that that can only be a good thing. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Now I'm going to go to another audience question and it picks up on the Peroni's disease like you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so this person's asked if surgery is the only fix. So let's start off by defining what surgery is. And that's a really good question. Um, so uh, Peyronie's is curvature of the penis. And it's actually, you know, the studies have shown that it's, it's probably really common, but a lot of guys are not going to talk about their penis there. And they're certainly not going to talk about it if there's some problem with it, like a curvature. So uh, they're estimated that they think maybe it's up to 5% of the community. And sometimes that might be really mild and then it goes away and you don't sort of hardly notice. But it's one of the things that I focus on a lot in my practice and it can be really mild and not such a big deal or it can be really, really, really impactful for men and their, their well-being. Because as you can imagine, Tim, I mean, if you get a severe curvature of the penis, that then may prevent you from having satisfactory sexual interactions mm -hmm. with whomever you want to do that with. Then all of a sudden, you know, your, your, your libido may drop because who wants to get involved in that when you know that you're not really able to perform and then the relationships don't work or you're not able to really successfully meet somebody and then your confidence hits rock bottom and then, you know, mental health issues arise, you know, with, with depression. So all of a sudden this issue to do with the curvature of the penis can, can really branch out. So um, I love working in this area because there's, there are things that we can do. And to answer the question, is surgery the only option? No, it's not. It's not the only option. Um, there is evidence to show that we can sometimes use uh, little devices, so traction devices. These are things that are used to try and straighten or stretch the penis mm -hmm. uh, or a vacuum erectile device. Vacuum devices are often seen um, you know, in, in, in pornography stores or sex stores. Uh, and uh, there's some evidence that that might be useful for trying to maintain the length. Um, but there's also other ways that we can deal with it. There's um, injections that you can... Uh, put into the penis. I know uh, well, you, 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 heard me, you heard me. All right. But, um, uh, you know, when we're talking about such a, a significant deformity to, to a guy's penis, then sometimes that's another option. And uh, they, they, they are a little bit pricey. That's the, 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 the uh, disadvantage, I guess, uh, with them. I, I wish the companies would make them uh, a lot cheaper if they're listening because uh, they're a good option uh, mm -hmm. for certain men. Um, and, uh, then if, if those are not an option, then yes, surgery is an option. There's various kinds of surgery. Um, and, uh, I think, uh, it's worthwhile having the discussion and being very clear about what the best treatment option may be with, um, your surgeon who's looking after you. Okay. I, did you know, I don't think we went into what causes Peroni's disease. Well, we didn't do that because we don't really know. Um, it's one of those things that in, in medicine, I mean, there are so many things we don't know the answer to. Uh, the theory, however, is that there's elements of small amounts of trauma which occur. And then there's this re repetitive, you know, erections and sexual interaction, which may cause a little bit of further trauma. And then the body tries to heal itself and then trauma and healing. That's the theory. Uh, but it's not really been um, definitely proven to be the case. There is certainly some increased association with other uh, diseases. There's a, a condition of the hand called Dupatron's contracture, where you get thickening in the palmar creases. And uh, guys who have that um, are probably 20 or 30% at risk of, of actually having Peyronie's disease and vice versa. So it's not just something related to the penis. There's something also within the body that seems to be at play. But the reality is we don't really know there's a minority of patients who may have some injury uh, to their penis or surgery or trauma otherwise that may increase the risk of Peyronie. So that does also form a cohort of men. 
But in the vast majority of guys, we don't really know uh, what causes it. And we don't really have an ideal non-surgical cure either at this stage, uh, which would be lovely. I mean, if we could have a pill or something that just melt, made it all melt away, that would be fantastic. But uh, there's been a lot of studies into it over the years. Lots of things have been looked at and tried. But uh, thus far, we're still, um, we're not there yet. And, and I suspect, you know, when it comes to medicine and research and finding things to, 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 to cure, uh, it, it, they need money. Mm-hmm. And we need money by, by people voicing the fact that there is a problem at play. And unfortunately, um, guys are not going to jump up on, 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 on the streets and say, hey, everyone, I've got this problem and this is a problem. So it's a difficult one to navigate. But uh, with more awareness, then perhaps we'll get uh, more support for looking into potential treatment options. Yeah. Thanks. That's, really, that's the best description of the why for Peronius disease, I think, that I've seen. Thank you. We've got another audience question, Gideon. Um, it's a long one, so bear with me while I read it. We've been on the IVF journey for a few years now with no success. My husband has a low sperm count. We usually use ICSI-8 transfers. Majority of the time, we see fertilization of some of the embryos. However, the last time, no embryo is fertilized. What test can be performed to test the sperm further to ensure that we gain a pregnancy after implantation? That's the first bit. Maybe just I'll get you to answer that. All right. Well, we'll chomp down on that. That's a really... Really good question and a tough situation uh, to be in, guys. Um, and uh, I, number one is hopefully you've got someone really good. It sounds like that's the case looking after you on the on the assisted reproduction side. I'll just um, highlight for those people who, who don't know what ICSI is. ICSI is basically um, a really high tech version of uh, getting eggs to marry with sperms and create uh, an embryo and subsequent make, make a baby. Um, and it's at, at its simplest, it's an injection of a sperm into an egg. So when people sort of think about that picture of, you know, uh, IVF or assisted reproduction, they see that needle or pipette going against the, the ovum and then this little egg, this little sperm going in, that's ICSI. Mm. Um, so we, uh, we often use ICSI. I mean, I, I don't do the assisted reproduction side. So when I say we, I'm, I'm implying my colleagues, uh, we'll use that when there's a more significant abnormality, particularly from the sperm, uh, low numbers and, and, and low quality sperm. Um, now, is there a test that we can use to try and look into whether or not sperm might be you know, healthier or otherwise? The one thing that I think could be considered in this situation is what's called DNA fragmentation rates. So the DNA fragmentation is just basically an assessment of how good a quality the DNA in the sperm are. So if you can imagine, uh, if you've got very robust DNA, that would imply that they're good quality. Whereas if you shake them around and they all fall apart and they don't hold themselves together, that may imply that the the quality of the sperm overall and the likelihood for success uh, in in treatments like ICSI may be lower. Now, this is a relatively... um, uh, novel area in relation to assisted reproduction. They've been using them for years and there's a, a few different types of doing, like machines that will perform uh, a DNA fragmentation and each lab may have one, but um, there's only four or five different types and we're still really learning more and more about DNA fragmentation index and what might be normal and how does that give us information for patients like yourself when you're asking really good questions like this. And I think in my practice, where do I use it? I think I would use it in this situation. And the reason why I would consider it is because if the DNA fragmentation is significantly high, meaning there's lots of damage to the DNA, there is a theory that as the, as the sperm go from the testicles into the next section of the pathway, which is the epididymis, in the epididymis is where a lot of maturation, a lot of growth of the sperm really occurs. So ideally you get good quality sperm, but Also, sometimes you might have a little bit of damage to the sperm as it goes through the epididymis because sometimes there may be a little bit of subclinical infection in the epididymis. So the the discussion then comes up, well, if the DNA fragmentation is high and you're having problems uh, conceiving, should we consider using sperm that's not in the epididymis, that's a little bit more mature, but maybe sperm that's directly from the testis? And uh, that's something that you may want to consider. But I would definitely have a discussion with your fertility specialist 
and ask them about DNA fragmentation and whether or not that may play a role and influence their decision and whether or not there's a role for testicular sperm. And, you know, there's, there's no absolute firm answer on that. It probably will depend on who you speak to, but it's at least something to discuss. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I want to pick up on two things that you said there, just, I guess, quick answers. The DNA fragmentation, what might cause that? I, I, I presume being unhealthy, smoking cigarettes, that sort of thing that we know affects DNA yep. in people's cells might be a yep. problem. Yeah. Um, is, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're, 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 we'll come back to those, the lifestyle thing. So as you mentioned, Tim, totally, it's, you know, keeping fit, making sure you're not overweight, avoiding toxins, uh, be it either, you know, illicit drugs or um, cigarette smoking fumes, etc. Avoidance of a lot of heat down in, in the scrotum. I mean, the testicles are in the scrotum and we think they, they need that cooler environment to be optimal for making sperm. So if you're sitting with a laptop on your uh, desk in these COVID times for 12 hours a day, that's not going to help. Uh, so make sure that you, 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 you know, you keep that area cool. Um, uh, varicocele, what we discussed before, that's been shown to also increase the DNA fragmentation rate. So any sort of insult uh, to the area may play a role. And really, apart from lifestyle factors, the varicocele is the one thing that, that surgeons like myself can really get involved in and try and adjust to try and assist uh, with improving the DNA fragmentation. Yeah. So the other thing that you mentioned in the answer to the question was the possibility of a low-grade infection or something in the epididymis. Mm -hmm. Do you mean a, a sexually transmitted infection or can there be other infections that men might have that result in that? It could be it could be a sexually transmitted infection, or it could be another uh, infection altogether. Um, so, and and there's probably again here a lot of uh, science that we don't know the answers to yet. There's some really early evidence that may suggest that certain sexually transmitted infections can cause sperm production issues, uh, like chlamydia, and chlamydia is horribly common. Um, but it may also be a, a, another infection, say in the seminal vesicles, perhaps. Um, and often these infections are not necessarily symptomatic. So men don't necessarily know if they've got them. So sometimes we'll look hard to exclude infection by, you know, getting certain bodily fluids, whether it's sperm or urine, to try and make sure that there's no infection in there. And that may be another way that we can uh, improve the current situation. Yeah. Thank you. Gideon, we'll have more questions in just a sec, but I've got to do a little reminder for the people who might have just joined us. Sounds um, great, Tim. Cool. My name's Tim. I'm from Healthy Male, and I'm here with Dr. Gideon Bletcher. He's an andrologist and urologist. He's defined those for us earlier, so you'll have to go back and have a look if you are wondering what exactly that is. Um, we're talking about male sexual health treatments. Um, Gideon really knows what he's talking about. You can use the Q&A button at the bottom of Zoom if you want to ask us a question. Or if you're looking on Facebook Live or YouTube, then just drop your question into the comments section. Okay, Gideon, I'm going to get right back to questions from the audience. And this is, a, this is an interesting one. Somebody says they've seen on Dr. Gideon's website something about buried penis. Mm -hmm. What is that? So a, a, a buried penis is basically a penis that's not really protruding out from the body as it once did or as it should. And uh, the main reasons why people may get a buried penis is it's almost always, but not always, but almost always in the context of someone who's a bit overweight. And you can get obesity that hangs from your belly button down and you've got a big beer belly. But also just below that, around the, the, the belt line, there's another area of fat called the suprapubic fat. And that's the fat that's kind of around where the pubic hair is and just above that. And sometimes uh, if you're overweight, that amount of fat can grow and grow and grow and grow. And the penis can then bury and bury and bury to the point where sometimes some people need to push all of that fat down in order to expose the penis in order to, you know, get hold of it and, and pee. Mm -hmm. um, so the problem is also more common in men who sometimes had certain operations. So sometimes you can get it if you've had a, a circumcision. Uh, but again, it's usually in the context of being overweight or if you've had surgery for rare things like a, a cancer, you know, if you've had a penile cancer, uh, then, you know, you need to remove part of the penis, say, then that can also cause a, a buried penis. So it's, it's, it's a really, it's one of those silent, 
things that are out there because again guys aren't going to stand up and say hey i've got this it's it's personal it's private and and it causes anxiety and and it's embarrassing for for many men but um it's it's not that uncommon uh we can do things to try and improve it uh the mainstay obviously is going to be weight loss uh but still even sometimes if people will lose a lot of weight they have that excess skin you know sometimes when you see people who've lost huge amounts of weight they've just got extra floppy skin around and that can still be around but you know we can remove that we can resect that sometimes we can uh, get a bit of liposuction to remove remove the fat now this is not cosmetic surgery this is this is liposuction for functional surgery because we want to try and get people being able to have their, their their penis viewable so that they can use it to void for sexual activity as well. So um, yeah, it's a great question and it's, it's not that common. And even amongst some surgeons, they, they don't even realize that what a buried penis is or how we might be able to help manage it. Yeah, thank you. I think everybody's learned a little something about buried penis. Um, so another part of the question from the, from the person who was asking about uh, sperm quality when you got into the DNA fragmentation chat. Yep. Um, and we've, we've discussed this, but I'm going to challenge you to put a number to something. Um, how much of male fertility may be, or male infertility, we should say, might be prevented by lifestyle factors, might be improved by lifestyle uh, I mean, I, w- I would say that there's almost, in all men, there's going to be some element that may be um, uh, changeable or improved. Um you know, it's, it's hard to put an exact number on how much improvement that will be, but we've all got some vice somewhere, don't we? And, uh, you know, uh, it's my job to, to, to hunt and look for those when, when men come and see me, not hunt is probably the wrong word. I mean, look, I'm, I'm here to help and I'm here to, to find the issues that we can try and address. Um, but, uh, you know, having slightly low numbers of sperm or poor quality sperm is, is, is just not that uncommon and neither are the lifestyle factors that may play into them. Yes. So I would say they're pretty common, but it's hard to exactly put a number on it. Sometimes it's not got nothing to do with lifestyle at all. Uh, it's got very other reasons, you know, other reasons behind it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's not always someone's fault per se. There are things we can do to improve it, but uh, some of the time there are real sort of disease processes or genetic reasons why there's a, 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 an imperfect result occurring. Yep. I, um, I like your uh, comment about hunting. Um, I often think that you must, uh, you must be a bit like a detective sometimes, sort of following clues to diagnose some of the things that you see in your patients. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our job uh, is, is a bit of pattern recognition. We're always listening to our patients carefully for you know, uh, the things that they say. Uh, the, the the symptoms they may have, and you know, paying close attention to what they're saying, and then closely, you know, looking at them, and you know, a physical exam can reveal a lot in the area of of male subfertility and in andrology. And all of the things we've discussed today: varicocele, Peyronie's disease, uh, male infertility, uh, buried penis. I mean, if you don't look at a patient closely, you're not going to see them properly. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a lot of detective work. And then we put that together. Usually we get some tests and some patients get a bit frustrated. Why do I need all these tests and so on? But the reality is we're trying to put things together to mm. confirm what we think is going on. And uh, when it comes to subfertility, well, yeah, we, we, there's a lot of different factors uh, at play. The semen analysis, uh, for example, we always get two. Uh, so you might come along with one, but uh, we'll often ask you to get a second. And, and that's in accordance with the World Health Organization guidelines. And the reason for that is because the semen production can vary on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, depending on all the factors that we were discussing earlier on. Yeah. So if you've been looking after yourself, you're in the sun, you're relaxed, there's no stress, you haven't been smoking and you, you were looking at those sperm, well, they might be of slightly better quality than if you've been bunkered down in your room with your laptop on your desk, working hard, stressed because you've got deadlines to make and you've got financial stress going on and you're on the booze a bit because it's all a bit difficult at the current point. So you can see how uh, things can be dynamic. So. Uh, yeah, we'll use those tests and then hopefully we'll come up with a bit of an idea of what's going on and try and get a solution where we can. Cool. All right, more audience questions. Uh, I've got four lined up here. So it's, um, it's nice to have such engagement from the people who are viewing, I think. It's great. I want to thank the, 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 the audience as well. I, I'm enjoying this and hopefully you're getting something out of it. If you're sitting there at home and you're sort of thinking, oh, look, uh, I'm a bit nervous to ask that question, please do. Now's the time. Uh, we're here and Tim and I are really happy to, to, to facilitate this ongoingly. So please jump in. 
Oh, there you go. Thank you. All right. What could cause blood in my semen if I don't have any STDs? So blood in your semen is a frightening symptom. I mean, all of a sudden you, your life is good and, and then in an ejaculate, somehow there's blood and, and that can be pretty scary. Uh, and um, uh, the reassuring thing with this is that it's almost always nothing nasty. Uh, sometimes you'll get it and it will disappear after a, f a few ejaculates. Uh, and I liken it to a blood nose. If you've got a blood nose, you know, once or twice, you, you probably go, that's strange, but you probably wouldn't get too worried about it. Uh, but if you had it repetitively, then you might go, oh, that's a bit uh, scary. Um, and so uh, what can cause it other than STIs? Well, yeah, STIs can cause it, but uh, sometimes uh, it's just simply a blood vessel that's a bit fragile and bursts. And right. it only takes a little bit of bleeding in that area in the seminal vesicle. Can you hold on? I'll grab a little model and I'll show the yeah, viewers. Cool. Oh, but... Let's see how we go with this. Anatomy lesson. Here we go. Awesome. Um, so this is the penis here. This is the prostate that lives underneath the bladder. Yeah. And the seminal vesicle is this little white organ here. And it's there where the ejaculate um, basically is made. Most of the ejaculate comes from the seminal vesicle. Some of the ejaculate comes from the prostate. So for all those guys out there going, what is the prostate and what does it do? It contributes about 10% of the ejaculate. Um, and uh, uh, when you're in the seminal vesicle, you've got blood vessels there and they can simply rupture. You can sometimes get little stones uh, which, which form in there and they cause a bit of inflammation. Uh, so that's another cause. Um, now, interestingly, um, if you've got really high blood pressure, um, that may uh, be a cause for some really small vessels to bleed. So we would always make sure that your blood pressure is well controlled and uh, the bleeding could come from potentially your testicles. So we would also look at those and make sure that the testicles are healthy and there's no sort of bleeding reason uh, occurring there. Yeah, cool. So blood in semen, I, I guess then it's not uh, bright red blood that you might see coming from a blood nose. It could be brown and kind of old blood cell. I guess. Yeah, look, when it first happens, Tim, you, it's going to be brighter. Uh, fresh blood is usually redder, uh, but then that can take a while to, to, to flush out because an ejaculate volume is pretty small. It's only a few mils. Um, and so it can take multiple ejaculates to clear all that stuff out. And as blood gets older, it goes from a red color to a darker red to a sort of a brown color. Uh, so if you see that it's going to a brown color, that's a good thing. It means that it's just settling down. Uh, but if you were to get recurrent hematospermia, which is blood in the sperm. Um, yeah, by all means, go, go and see your doctor and get it checked out. Uh, and, and we'll usually look at a few things, uh, what I mentioned, including also the prostate. So you'll probably score yourself a prostate exam, which is, uh, you know, ne necessary at times. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And if needed, worth it. Yep. Did you know, I know that people like this because we're being thanked for doing this session uh, ahead of this next question. On your website, it says that you do gender reassignment surgery. Can you talk about, a little bit about that, please? Sure. So um, gender reassignment surgery uh, is, is, is for trans uh, uh, folks out there. Uh, and uh, many people who suffer from gender dysphoria, which is uh, when people don't feel that they've kind of been uh, born with the right appendages, really, uh, some of whom uh, may be comfortable to a degree in the body that they are, some of whom uh, uh, may want to use certain things like hormones to change how their body is, some of whom may want to go on to have certain surgeries. Um, so the surgeries that I've been involved in are those related to the genitals. So uh, for um, a trans male, uh, that's someone who's um, born as, as a female, uh, a trans male want to, may want to undergo phalloplasty. Phalloplasty is when we basically create a penis and we can do that in a variety of ways. We can use uh, either you know, the forearm or we can use the tummy or maybe tissue from the leg. And we mm -hmm. basically roll it into a tube and, and, and make a, a penis. Now we can also uh, make the urethra, which is the water pipe tube uh, for some people. Uh, and that way, you know, we've got, we can create a penis, which is not just 
aesthetically, uh, you know, uh, the the right idea, but it also functions that way. Mm-hmm. So so it can it can drain the urine out, and someone can pee in a standing position, and that's quite important for some trans males. Mm-hmm. Um, and finally, we can also eventually put a penile implant in into a phalloplasty, and that way. Uh, trans guys can can you know, utilize it for sexual purposes. Uh, um, so that's really the trans male side of things. From the uh, trans female side of things, uh, a vaginoplasty is uh, a surgery which removes the penis and uh, basically turns it into a um, the external genitalia of a female. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that may involve simply the labia, the, you know, on the outside, uh, but some uh, trans females may want to proceed and have um, a bit of a cavity formed for sexual purposes. Uh, so they're really the, the two main options for gender reaffirming surgery uh, from the genital perspective. But um, there's lots of different types of gender reaffirming surgeries, some of which might be the voice or the face or the chest, but the ones that uh, I'm involved in relate to, to down below. Yeah, I, I think that's important pointing out that there are a variety of different uh, medical treatments versus surgical treatments, and then within the surgical treatments, a suite of things that get done. And of course, not everybody who chooses to change their gender uh, necessarily has any or all of those. Sure, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 far from binary, as we all know. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. Okay. Um, Oh, I'm falling behind. Is a hydrocele a type of hernia? I see the term inguinal hernia alongside hydrocele, and I'm confused. Um, I had bilateral inguinal hernia when I was an infant. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, they're quite common. Uh, a hernia is basically when, when something is sort of pushing out from one location and pushed into another location that it almost shouldn't be in. So the testicles when uh, uh, babies are, are inside the womb um, and the baby's developing, the testicles are actually in the abdomen. Um, and what happens is that as the baby grows, the testicles then move down, lower down, lower down, and eventually get to the groin area and they sort of push themselves out and make their way down into the scrotum. Um, so as they push out from the abdomen and go into the scrotum, they push a sleeve of, of tissue um, and that sleeve of tissue acts like a sock, for example. Now, so if the testicle goes into that sock, it goes up to here. And then normally what should happen is that sock should actually seal itself over so that the contents of the tummy in the intestines, the guts, etc., can't go down that sock tube and hang out next to the testicle and the scrotum. But a hernia is that. A hernia is when the, the contents of the, of the abdomen, and it's often maybe just a bit of fat or maybe even sometimes a bit of bowel, uh, can make its way down into the scrotum. Um, now, a hydrocele is different to that. Um, uh, but there is, a, there is one area where they can cross over, and I'll explain. Yep. A hydrocele is simply fluid around the testicle. Now, it's normal for every man to have fluid around a testicle, but usually it's just a very small amount. If there is, for some reason, imbalance, like a large production or not so much reabsorption of that fluid, because so the fluid's always changing, then that fluid might accumulate. And so then you may start to notice that one side of the scrotum is getting bigger than the other. Mm-hmm. There's other reasons why that could be. So if well, that is happening, you do need to get that checked out. But uh, if it's shown to just be simply fluid, that's pretty reassuring and often um, may or may not require any treatment. Now, the viewer's question was, can they be associated with a hernia? And the answer is yes. So remember that sock that I was describing, which normally closes up. If that sock doesn't uh, close up completely, uh, then you can sometimes get a bit of fluid that comes from the abdomen and it leaks down the groin via that little sock tunnel uh, and sits around the testicle. And that is a hydrocele, but it's a hydrocele related to a hernia-like type issue. Um, and that's called a patent processus vaginalis. The processus vaginalis is that sock-like tube that normally Go, is, is, is obliterated, it goes away. Uh, but sometimes in some younger people, if they have a hydrocele, they may need to have that little patent processus vaginalis addressed at the same time as the hydrocele. Otherwise, it's probably going to recur. Right. Thank you. Okay. If you're diagnosed with testicular cancer, is the whole testicle taken out? And if it is, can you get a fake one? Yeah. 
The answer is yes and yes. So um, generally, unless there's a very good reason otherwise, the whole testicle that's affected by a cancer is removed. Now, thankfully, most guys will have two. And the other one can usually compensate and do all the work that's needed. So both testosterone function, but also sperm production. Not always though. So say for example, somebody was born with one testicle or they had a bad accident, was removed, or maybe they had a testicular cancer previously and had an operation already. And then all of a sudden there's a problem in the single testis. Well, maybe in that situation, we wouldn't remove the whole testicle. Maybe we'd try and just remove the cancerous part. So that's, that's uh, maybe a reason why you wouldn't, but in general, the answer is yes, you remove the entire uh, testicle because that gives you the best chance of cure. And the chance of cure when it comes to testicular cancer in general is excellent. It's really good. Um, so if you notice uh, guys or, or partners of guys, if, if there's a lump on the testicle that wasn't there, get it checked out, go and see your GP. It's really straightforward to get a quick ultrasound and the, the answers will be there. If it is a cancer, we, you know, most guys far, far away uh, are going to be perfectly fine. Uh, sometimes there are other treatments that are needed for it, but a lot of the time we can cure it just by simply removing that testicle. And can we put in a fake one? Absolutely. Yeah. A, a, a testicular prosthesis uh, is easily just dropped into the scrotum there. And uh, I say to guys, just make sure that you walk in a straight line. Otherwise you might veer off to the side, but uh, uh, they're very straightforward. There's low risk of, of major problems. Uh, sometimes they can cause a bit of annoyance if they're not sitting right. But most of the time, if you get it right uh, and, and, and you know, a patient wants it, that's, that's easily done. So when the tester sits in the scrotum, is it kind of tethered in place by our body's tissues? Uh, yeah, there's when an element of around it. <laughs> it depends. Uh, some guys that might be able to rattle around a bit more actually, and that can cause its own problem. Yeah. It's not completely fixed. I mean, if you have an operation uh, on a testicle and then you replace the testicle, there'll be an element of scarring and fixed yeah. uh, situation that may occur. Yeah. But uh, for most guys, there's an element of some free movement of the testicle. Now, if the, the testicle was to move so freely that it was able to twist around on itself, mm -hmm. well, that, that causes a very significant painful problem uh, known as torsion. Yep. Um, so a torsion is basically when um, uh, you get a twisting of the testicle. And what I, to explain it, that the, there's a cord or a, a string say uh, that, that is attached to the testicle and through that string, through the, through the tummy. And uh, as we discussed before, comes all the blood vessels and the vas. The vas is the tube that takes sperm away from the testicle and uh, hence vasectomy uh, for guys who want to have that performed. Um, uh, when you take a testicle and you twist it around and everyone, you know, all these guys are now wincing. Oh, don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's if, that, if that was to twist around, you can imagine that if those blood vessels are getting twisted and twisted, they're cutting off their blood supply. So a torsion can occur when um, uh, they're generally younger guys. So guys in their teenage twenties, thirties, but you can get them at any stage, uh, even up to 50s, 60s, or even seventies, it's been reported. So it can happen when you're older, but it's in a really full on pain. I mean, you can imagine what I was describing before. It's not just a little bit of pain. They're very, very uncomfortable. Can't really do anything else at the time. It may happen just suddenly like that. Um, and, uh, they need to be seen in an emergency department pronto. If you get sudden onset of really severe pain, don't wait it out. Uh, go and go to an emergency department or your GP if it's the daytime, uh, because time is of the essence in that situation. Uh, it's not uncommon that uh, you, a, a urologist or a surgeon will come and, uh, and assess you. And uh, if they're not sure, we'll just take you quickly to theater and have a quick look. It's very simple to have a quick look. I mean, it's not like you're delving down and scrotum's right there. Uh, it's a little cut and we can just make sure that everything's good. And if it's twisted, we can untwist it and save it if we get it in time. Yeah, cool. It's good to know. Okay. Uh, we have a few more questions, but I'm actually getting the wind up from the people behind the scenes here. Um, so I'll ask you for... I was, just, I was just about to crack open a bottle of wine and I thought we were, yeah, yeah. We were just getting into it, Tim. It's certainly beer o'clock where I am. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask a couple of them just quickly, Gideon. Perhaps we'll have to get back together and do this again. Um, what does the prostate contribute to the ejaculate? You said before that it does something. 
Yeah, so it contributes a little bit of fluid. The, the prostate's made up of muscle, a bit of uh, muscle, not like in your not like in your arm, but smooth muscle, which uh, is around glands. So, and the glands secrete a little bit of fluid, uh, and um, that fluid makes up the, you know part of the ejaculate but only a small contribution. It also secretes PSA. Now, yep. PSA is what that blood test that a lot of guys will end up getting when we're considering whether or not we want to be looking for, for, for nasties like prostate cancer. And the role of, of PSA is actually to try and liquefy uh, the, 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 the sperm so that they don't become all clumpy and solidify. Uh, so the, remains, the ejaculate remains in a fluid form so that then when the ejaculate happens, it remains in fluid. Right, thank you. All right, so now I'm getting told there's no rush. You can finish the questions from the people who have answered, asked them. So that's good. great. Yeah, I think we should do that. I think we owe it to our viewers. Yes. Um, I'll go to the medical one and then there's a more general one. What about penis transplants? Has that been done yet? Yeah, it has. There's a um, there's a couple of places, but it was pioneered really in South Africa uh, by a group there. Uh, there's a lot of ethical problems with penile transfer because um, uh, you're you're basically having to immunosuppress someone, so you're putting them on medications to lower their immune system really quite substantially, and that can potentially put their life at risk if they were to develop a severe enough infection. Uh, when you know you're transplanting a penis. Now, I'm all for saying that the penis is important, but when it comes to ethics and so on, uh, you know they'll look at something like, say, a, a lung transplant or a heart transplant, which you you can't really live without a heart. Um, and so, although the penis is an amazingly important organ, we would all agree uh, you, you you can live without it. Um, so therefore the ethics uh, is, a, is a big play. And the reason why it started in South Africa is because there's a lot of um, tribal cultural circumcision rituals which occur. And uh, sometimes, you know, that's not held necessarily in the same way that perhaps some form of circumcision may happen uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a first world country and complications can occur. And uh, it, it's, 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 it's quite full on, but um, uh, pen and penises can get lost and sometimes patients or well, people may, can sometimes die from this. So uh, unfortunately, but that, that then spurred on this program in South Africa to say, well, what can we do to help these guys? So that's where it has started. It hasn't really taken off yet in the rest of the world because I guess you really need um, you know, to, to push a lot of the ethics through and have the population and highly specialized surgeons to support that kind of uh, thing, yeah. Yeah, I think it's important to remember that it's um, not necessarily to have a penis to be a man, to feel like a little No, man. look, I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of guys who, who I may manage who end up, you know, uh, with, without for, for a variety of reasons. And uh, look, there's a lot of psychology that that's going to affect. I mean, uh, for many of us men, uh, a penis is, is a, a large component of our, of our manliness. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, there are ways that we can get around it. We were talking about phalloplasty before, and that, that has certainly been done for not just gender population, but, you know, also for uh, cis males. So genetic males, males who were born as men who for some reason lose their penis or, or have a, a tiny micro penis, uh, which might be from a, a disease process or something like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, there are things that can be done sometimes, I guess, and that's, that's, a, that's an upshot. Yeah, um... Gideon, there are so many things that we can talk about. Um, I'm going to ask you this last question from the audience. Uh, I'll leave my question that I was going to ask you till next time. What's your favourite thing about being a doctor? Ah, good one. I like that question. I, um, you know, it sounds so cheesy. You know, why do you want to be a doctor? The best thing that I can do is that when I say to, when I say goodbye to a patient as they leave the rooms or the consultation, uh, I hope, I hope, I hope you feel a bit better now. And, and when they say, you know what, I, I do. And it's not because we've done anything. We've just spoken about stuff, whether or not we're going to have surgery or other treatments. Sometimes it's just about having knowledge. And I love being able to, to, you know, break things down. You can hear, I've used metaphors a lot throughout tonight's talk. And I like doing that. I like trying to figure out ways to, you know, get the, the medical knowledge over to a patient so that they can understand and go, cool, got it understood and uh you know without pressure without sort of 
uh, anxiety, come to a treatment decision that, that the patient really wants. Uh, I like guiding them through that path. I think that's a real, a real privilege. Mm. And um, particularly in the area of andrology, I mean, I, I get guys coming in and very soon after we sit in the chair, we're talking about some really personal things and, you know, nobody else gets to do that. No mm. one else has the, the privilege to mm. enter a patient's sort of personal world like that. And, and I love being able to do that and, and I, I value it highly. Yeah, and I bet it is highly valued from your patients too, I'm sure. Hopefully. I'm sure. All right, I have to wrap it up. Um, that brings to the end our final Men's Health Week webinar from Healthy Male. I want to thank everybody who's joined us, especially the people who asked us questions. Uh, I'm going to hassle Healthy Male about perhaps doing this more regularly and we'll see if we can't get more questions answered to you. Um, I also want to thank Carmen Broadhurst and Hannah Kingston. They're behind the scenes uh, and the rest of the Healthy Male team in putting this webinar and all of the other ones that we've done this week together. Um, I want to say to people that if they've missed the other webinars that we've run over the course of Men's Health Week, uh, they can find them on YouTube. You can go to healthymail.org.au to access a wealth of information from Healthy Male on male reproductive and sexual health mainly, but other things too. Um, we release new information in weekly articles, videos, Q&As and other things like that. So you can subscribe to email lists, follow us on Facebook and Twitter and that sort of stuff. Okay. Gideon, thank you so much for your insight tonight. Um, we've spoken about some really personal, some really important stuff. Um, thank you for that. I'm sure that everybody who's been watching thanks you too. Oh, it's been my pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me on board and I hope everyone's found that useful. So as Tim said, head to Healthy Mail and uh, keep looking after yourselves and have a great weekend. Thanks, mate.